Good morning, everybody. I've already said good morning to the people in the room, but now I'm saying good morning to the people at home. Welcome to God's Holy Darkness, which is a reading by my dear friend, Cherie Green, who's here. She's in North Carolina with us all, which is an absolute delight. Cherie is a seminarian at LSTC in Chicago. We met when I was serving in Chicago, and we became fast friends and are very good friends. Um, and I'm just so excited to have her here. She, when she first told me that she had written a book, I was like, we're doing something. So at first it was going to be in Chicago, and now I'm very excited <laughs> that it can be here um, to share with all of you. I think that you will really enjoy this. So after she reads the book, we are going to have a time where you can draw back there. There's a table back there. And I want you to draw what your images of God are. What do you imagine when you think of what God might look like? Um, there's paint, there's stuff like that, or just start thinking about that. What are some of the images that you have in your mind about who God is? And then after Sheree reads, we're going to, while she reads, we're going to dim the lights. And after she reads, we're going to raise the lights, and I will pass the mic, of, mic around for questions and for answers. So um, I think that's it. Anything else? Okay, without further ado, God's Holy Darkness. Good morning, Christ the King. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and share this book with you all. All right, let's get started. So this book is called God's Holy Darkness. It is by myself, Sheree Green, and Becca Selnick, and illustrated by uh, Nikki Faison. Darkness and blackness and night are too often compared to lightness and whiteness and day and found deficient. But let us name the beauty and goodness and holiness of darkness and blackness and night. God uses darkness and blackness and night to show love for the world. Creation began in the dark. In the beginning, darkness covered the face of the deep. God poured out love and brought all things into being. Creation is God's work done in holy darkness. When Abraham began to doubt God's promises, the Lord took him on a walk and pointed to the night sky. Look toward the heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. Later, Jacob wrestled all night with God and was changed forever. The beginning of the many nations and peoples of the Lord is the work of God's beautiful darkness. At midnight, the Lord passed over Egypt and set the people free. Samuel heard a small voice calling to him in the dark and became a mighty prophet. When the temple was complete, King Solomon said, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness the Spirit of God dwells in the holy darkness where we are invited to be held in God's love. Angels appeared to the shepherds in the dark and told them of a baby in a manger. The disciples gathered with Jesus for the Holy Supper as the day turned to night. When Jesus died on the cross, the day went from black, went black from noon to three. Creation began in holy darkness, and our new lives as free people in Christ began in the darkness of the sky that day. God saved all creation, and it was the work of God's beautiful, good, and holy darkness. Rich black soil brings forth abundant life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. 
But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The deep dark of the ocean holds more life than even has been discovered. And we are reminded of the size of God's creation through the boundless, beautiful black of outer space. From the beginning of creation to the stars in the night sky, we are shown God's love. In houses of worship with dark spaces for wonder, we are held in God's love. In the dark soil, in the deep sea, we are reminded of God's love. From the promise of peace made to the shepherds at night, to the promise Jesus made on the cross, these are the beautiful works of God's holy darkness. Thank you. So how would you feel about reading the note for caregivers? Absolutely. Thank you. A note for caregivers. In our world and in our lives, blackness should be celebrated. Darkness should foster wonder and awe, and we should find comfort and rest in the night. But instead, we usher in light, dark binaries. Look to John 1.5. The light shall shine in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. The passage speaks of literal lightness and darkness, but we have ascribed qualities of good versus bad to light and darkness, with light being good and dark being bad. With the construct of race, these attributes were given to people with light-colored skin, white, and people with dark-colored skin, black and brown. But we are called and always have been called to disrupt this binary thinking and ultimately disrupt and dismantle the systems that value lightness over darkness, whiteness over blackness. God's holy darkness features beloved Bible stories. Sometimes we know stories so well we forget to listen to them. This book challenges us to hear those stories in a new way to hear the stories of the beauty and holiness and goodness of blackness and darkness and night. Read these words and ask questions. What, what, others may, what other ways can we challenge our perceptions of race and church and theology? When you imagine God, Jesus, or other biblical figures, what do they look like? What images have you seen? What images are hung in your church buildings? Look and listen at what is there. Look and listen for what is missing. Seek comfort and rest at night. Wonder at the mystery of the dark. Celebrate blackness. Disrupt the binary and welcome God's holy darkness. Thank you, Sheree. I think that's such a beautiful note and it's so important. So I really wanted you to read that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give Sheree a round of applause. Thank her for being here. Okay, so now it's time, if y'all have any questions, we can, can we raise the lights in the back so that people can draw if they want to over the drawing section? Or I'll, I can do it, okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions? I know you have one. While you're asking your question, I'll turn, oh, thanks, Heidi. Well, before my question, I wanna say something about darkness and lightness and how much they need each other. Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking about the stars at night in a show I recently saw. And the darker it was outside, you know, sometimes the more stars you can see in the sky. And so it's like, you know, the darkness and the lightness really need each other. And yeah, and my question is, um, what inspired you to write the, the um, book? Thank you, thank you for that question. And yes, the darker it is, the more you can see the stars. Um, as someone who grew up in a big city like Chicago, light pollution is a real thing and you, I don't get to see the stars, but I went to school at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, and I had the habit of looking up just wasn't there because the stars couldn't be seen. The first time I looked up, it was weeks had went by and I was astounded at the stars. Um, so thank you for sharing that and allowing me to share that story. Um, so writing this book, um, funnily enough, 
Um, a friend, my co-author, Becca, um, is the one who had the idea for it. Um, and she ha her mother is Bishop Eden. And Bishop had written um, something about uh, God's, about darkness. And she was like, I feel like this could be a children's book. Um, but as a white woman, she was like, I don't think this is a story. I should tell my, by myself. Um, and we had been colleagues at the churchwide office, and she knew that I did some writing there. So she gave me, she sent me a random uh, message on uh, Facebook Messenger. It was like, hey, would you be interested in doing this project with me? Um, and at first I was thinking she was looking for like a consultant to make sure everything was PC. And I was like, yeah, I can help you out. Um, so I was kind of reading what she had, and she, and I was like, yeah, this is pretty good. She was like, well, you haven't, like, added your flavor to it. You haven't, like, changed any words or did anything. And I was like, well, I don't want to change your work. And she was like, our work. This is ours together. Um, and with that, it kind of changed how I thought about it, right? Um, I really got to tap into who I am as a black woman, right? And like what, what, it, what was the story I would have, what I needed when I was a kid that I didn't get to affirm the beauty and holiness and goodness of blackness. Um, and so from there, I jumped into the project wholeheartedly uh, and actually uh, introduced Becca to uh, Nikki Faison, who's a really good friend of mine. I was like, if you're looking for an illustrator, I know a great artist. Um, and so together we've been on this journey since like fall 2020. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. Any more questions? So I'm reflecting on um, the images that um, black and brown children need to see and, and how they need to see themselves reflected in the books that we read. And um, I think that uh, as an educator, you know, in the schools, we're getting better at that. We've been terrible, um, but you know, we're making a baby step. But I wonder if you see a, um, a corresponding growth in Sunday school materials, you know? Like, what are we feeding our children at church? And are we reflecting black and brown children in our materials? Um, I think they're like, uh, like you said, we're getting better, but there's still a great lack of um, diverse materials for people to see themselves reflected. Um, in more than just every now and then you'll get like a, a like vacation Bible school or a Sunday school curriculum, curriculum where there'll be maybe images. Uh, there might be like the one brown kid um, or the one black kid, but um, none of the actual text or material is reflective, um, it, just the image, right? Um, and I think like, um, so yeah, there's much work to be done to, um, go beyond just having an image to reflect diversity. The words matter, right? And the words that we emphasize matter, right? Because the words can be there, but if, like, like we said in the book, if we know a story really well, we can skip over um, those parts, right? Um, so, yes. I hope I answered your question. Sheree, what might that do for um, children, for future generations to have themselves reflected in the image of God? Um, so I'll tell you a little story. I'm a storyteller, so I do everything in story. Um, so um, when Nick first presented her image of God that she wanted to use for the book, um, while we do not gender God in this book, it was uh, the imagery, while you never see their face, is intentionally feminine, right? Intentionally thick, intentionally have long silver locks, right? And as a fat black woman with locks, my first time seeing it, I wept, like full-blown ugly cried, because I was like, wow, I see myself in God, right? And like, I, as someone who, I always see myself as being a part of the Imago Day. I had never seen it represented as something I could look at, right? Um, and so like that imagery like really did something to me. And I'm, I'm like shaking just thinking about it. It still, 
does something to me to like see it physically represented as like I am made in the image of God, like we all are. Um, and I'm sorry, Nakia, I've lost the question in telling my story. What was the original question? And I, loved it. I said, what might it do for future generations? But I was also going to say about people in our generation or anyone having themselves reflected in the image of God. Uh, yes, and so it is so affirming to like have like a, to see yourself reflect it and it, it really changes how you, it can change how you show up, right? Like if you, like it's, um, it can inspire a boldness that may not be there. Um, it can inspire, um, and it can, it, 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 it can be very inspiring and affirming to, um, again, physically see a representation and it like gives you a kind of confidence that you didn't, speaking from my experience, right, a kind of confidence that you wouldn't necessarily, um, that will be more inherent than having to learn over, um, over years, right? Like my understanding of me, of God also looking like me didn't come until I, I was an adult, right? But if had I seen images, right, it would have reinforced early on um, that I was also made in the image of God and it wouldn't have to be something I learned and like having to unlearn, right, all the things that, um, unlearning is much more harder, is much harder than, um, so I hope that was clear. No, that was good. I think people who have the privilege to grow up thinking that they might be in the image of God have a different sense of self-worth already. And mm -hmm. so having to unlearn the harm that happens when you are told that you are so far from the image of God and the empowerment that comes when you're told, no, you are the image of God. So thank you for being mm -hmm. vulnerable. Yeah, I, uh, thanks for helping us unlearn those images of God and, and relearn these. Um, I, I thought it was such a powerful book, and uh, it, it meant a lot to me, and um, it was, what I, what I feel about uh, when I read it was not just a book, it was, it's a Bible, right? Mm. It's a Bible, it's telling the Bible, it's telling the biblical story, really beginning to end in a beautiful way, um, which just makes the other Bibles we read that much more of a fuller vision, right? Which, uh, that, was, that was really beautiful for me. Um, my question, which is a genuine curiosity, is um, I noticed that um, you didn't touch upon the color of the skin of the people in these Bible stories. Um, you didn't say, you know, and they were Egyptian, right? And Egyptians... And I, I was imagining that was a conscious decision or that's something that y'all had thought about, um, but also maybe that doesn't show up in Scripture quite the same way, right? Maybe, it, um, anyway, I was just wondering if, if that's something that, that uh, you thought about. As you're saying, you know, seeing ourselves in these stories, seeing ourselves in God, um, if skin color was something that you thought about putting in and didn't. I'm genuinely just curious about what that was like. Yeah, thank that, you for that, that question. that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, and it was something that I, I thought about, um, but I think in the end, why I chose not to is because I didn't want to emphasize, we were writing a book for all children and I wanted to, um, I, part of me felt like emphasizing skin would reinforce the binary in a way that we were trying to deconstruct it, right? And so I wanted to highlight um, the other things in which that, like, because we all know skin color and like how that binary um, exists and looks, right? But like, we aren't always as conscious of the things that reinforce it, right? And so we wanted to highlight those things, the things that, that reinforce it, the silent things, right? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Like the things that are so embedded in our culture that reinforce mm -hmm. this binary. Thank you. 
So I was informed that some people thought that it started at 10. Are there people here who, who got here a little late and missed the reading? Anybody? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, my dear. So uh, we have time. Shri, would you mind reading it again? I would not. Okay. Darkness and blackness and night are too often compared to lightness and whiteness and day and found deficient. But let us name the beauty and goodness and holiness of darkness and blackness and night. God uses darkness and blackness and night to show love to the world. Creation began in the dark. In the beginning, darkness covered the face of the deep. God poured out love and brought all things into being. Creation is God's work done in holy darkness. When Abraham began to doubt God's promises, the Lord took him on a walk and pointed to the night sky. Look toward the heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. Later, Jacob wrestled all night with God and was changed forever. The beginning of the many nations and peoples of the Lord is the work of God's beautiful darkness. At midnight, the Lord passed over Egypt and set the people free. Samuel heard a small voice calling to him in the dark and became a mighty prophet. When the temple was complete, King Solomon said, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. The spirit of God dwells in the holy darkness where we are invited to be held in God's love. Angels appeared to the shepherds in the dark and told them of a baby in a manger. The disciples gathered with Jesus for the Holy Supper as the day turned to night. When Jesus died on the cross, the day went black from noon to three. Creation began in holy darkness, and our new lives as free people in Christ began in the darkness of the sky that day. God saved all creation, and it was the work of God's beautiful, good, and holy darkness. Rich soil, rich black soil brings forth abundant life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The deep dark of the ocean holds more life than has even been discovered. We are reminded of the size of God's creation through the boundless, beautiful black of outer space. From the beginning of creation to the stars in the night sky, we are shown God's love. In houses of worship with dark spaces for wonder, we are held in God's love. In the dark soil and the deep sea, we are reminded of God's love. From the promises of peace made to the shepherds at night, to the promise Jesus made on the cross, these are the beautiful works of God's holy darkness. Thank you. Mm. I feel like it was even more powerful hearing it a second time after hearing you answer the questions. So thank you so much for yeah, doing that absolutely. again. Does anyone else have any questions or even comments that you want to share? Thank you, Cherie. I love the story and um, love your telling of the story about the story. So uh, my question for you is, um, does this uh, scratch an itch for you and might, th might this be um, the start of more storytelling? 
Thank you for that question. Um, I don't have an answer to it, but I am open to where God leads me. Nice. Good answer, Pastor. Um, does anyone else have any questions, comments? Well, Cherie will be with us still um, throughout the morning. She will be continue selling books out in the atrium and signing books. So make sure to, we have a swipe so we can use credit cards and we also have cash and we can give you change back. Um, so be sure to buy those and she'll be at that table. And then she's also going to be helping me a little bit with worship. So if you wanna come and come to the, I'm not trying to take people away from your service, Pastor Daniel, but just plugging Cherie. <laughs> She'll be serving communion over there in Contemporary at 11 with me, unless Pastor CC takes her away. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Shri, do you want to say anything else? Uh, I just say I, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you all for welcoming me with such open arms and such curiosity and great questions. Um, it's uh, truly a joy to get to share this with people. So thank you. Thank you for being here, Shri. Thank you, people of Christ the King. I appreciate your curiosity and your wonder and your openness to have this here. I appreciate the staff who just trusted me and just let me host this without asking any questions, which is pretty amazing. So thank you so much, y'all. I really appreciate everybody. So you can buy books if you want or stick around after. Thank you. <laughs>